Check, check, check. So I'm going to have a sip of water before I start. So also, just to preface this, we're not going to be as sensual or aggressive as Cornell West theory. Hopefully I'm so we'll, sorry about that. Hopefully we'll come off as half the entertainment because they were, they were awesome. So thanks for having us tonight, guys. It's so good to be here with you all. Um, this is such a special place for us. We have a cafe outside in the lobby. And it's a very beautiful cafe. It was um, commissioned to Japanese artist Hiroshi Sugimoto, and it was built in Japan as a work of art. Um, we can't ever replicate anything like it. Um, it's one of a kind. And, and my point is, the Hershon has been so good to us. And DC has been so good to us. This is where we built our business, Dolcezza. Um, how many of you are familiar with Dolcezza? Woo! That's mm -hmm. huge. All right. We opened the store in the first store in uh, Georgetown in 2004. Um, but before we talk about Dolcezza, I want to take you way back to where we met and when we met in the year 1999. So I'll, I'll preface, I'll talk about a little bit before and what led me up to our meeting in um, 1999. So I, I grew up in the South, specifically in Marietta, Georgia, about half an hour north of Atlanta. So it was a suburb, but back in the 70s and 80s, it was really country rural. So I, I kind of grew up with a stranger things kind of thing, bicycles, my friends in the woods and the creeks, fishing, swimming, setting fires, building forts, digging tunnels, you name it. That, my dad says that when I was two, he built a fence around my yard because I would be just gone all day long. So that, that was a major influence on my life. And then also being in the South, was the element of religion and conservative values and tradition. So it, that, that imposed bizarre limits w with movies and music and drugs and alcohol, sex, all the good stuff, you know? So <laughs> it really, it, it, uh, it was a little bit of like Stranger Things crossed with Footloose, if you can imagine what that movie would be like. So uh, from a young age, I can remember being a teenager, I, was, I wanted to get the hell out of the South. I just wanted to go somewhere that was different, that, was, that spoke different languages. I just wanted to get away from, from, from the South. So I ended up going up the road to Georgia Tech. I studied engineering. I graduated in 1996. And I got a software job in San Francisco. So I, with a friend of mine at the Atlanta Institute of Art, I put, packed a rider truck, leaving as the Olympics were arriving in Atlanta in 96. And I drove all the way to San Francisco. And, and started my job there doing software engineering. So I ended up living in San Francisco for a year. I, I went down to do some installations in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I lived there for about a year and a half. And then I ended up in Portland, Oregon when I got back from, from Brazil just due to a snowboarding trip. I skateboard, snowboard, that's my, I, my thing, I love it. So that took me up to Portland after a trip up to um, Mount Hood and Bachelor. So, this was about four years of, of doing this job, software engineering, and I, I couldn't stand it. It was going to large corporations like Nestle, Philip Morris, et cetera, and doing installations of their systems and, and all that stuff. So when I went to um, Portland, I told my boss, I was like, I'm going to do one more project, and then I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. I'm going to go travel, take a sabbatical, and find out what the hell I wanted to do with my life. So I, I did one more project. I quit. And then I traveled down to Manaus, Brazil in 1999, and that's where we pick up this whole story and this intersection. I was 20 years old, and Rob was 27. And we were going through an existential crisis, you know, the dark night of the soul kind of thing. And some of you may be thinking that I was a little too young to go through that, so I want to give you my story. Um, I grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and we have the highest number of shrinks per capita. So I was doing therapy when I was a baby. And by the time I was eight, I was writing poems about life and death. And then by 15, I was smoking weed, like one does, right? 
and uh, I was getting tattoos and playing the bass in a band. And by 20, I was just ready to go into the deep stuff. <laughs> yeah, very much. Um, I was kind of disappointed with, you know, the things that were told are going to make us happy. And um, I just wanted to find true love. And I quickly realized that in order to do that, I needed first to find myself. Um, so I decided to go to an ayahuasca conference. <laughs> ayahuasca is a psychotropic plant that shamans drink in the jungle to heal the tribe. So I decided to go there and um, here I go to the Amazon and before I go, my shrink tells me, hey, you need to set up an intention for the trip. And I was like, okay, um, I want to find my soulmate. And uh, I jumped I on a plane. I had no idea about this intention, by the way, before we had met. Okay. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so basically, I jump on a plane. I go down to the Amazon jungle. Um, I get to Brazil. Um, I hop on a cab. I go to this hotel. I get there, I sat on the front steps, and I just look at traffic. So I, I had arrived the night before, and I was already in the hotel, and I was sitting there on the balcony, smoking a cigarette, doing kind of the same thing, watching traffic. We were in Manaus, it's the largest uh, city in the Amazon jungle in Brazil. And so I, I saw her sitting on the stairs, and, and it was just, you know, it was like she said, it was this existential crisis. What are we going to do with our lives? It's like, what the fuck? I'll go talk to her and introduce myself. It just wasn't typically the thing that I, I would do. So I walked down, I walked up next to her, sat down, and we just struck up a conversation. And we talked about everything, about life, death, the ayahuasca. Why the hell are you going in there to do this? Are you afraid? Are you scared? Where do you come from? All that stuff. And I, just this 30-minute conversation, I thought she was the coolest, most beautiful girl that I talked to. And 20 years later, I still think the same thing. <laughs> Lucky me. Um, I just looked at him and I thought, you know what? He might be the one. And of course, I was completely biased, right? I had gone to the Amazon jungle to find my soulmate. And the first guy who approached me is like super handsome and I felt a connection with him. So I was like, whoa, this voodoo thing is really working. <laughs> and the funny thing is neither of us spoke each other language. But it didn't matter. Um, we traveled together for a long time. First we trip in the jungle for 10 nights and drank ayahuasca. <laughs> And then we went to the market and we bought hammocks and we hooked them in onto a boat and then we traveled down the Amazon River for 1,500 miles. And by the second day, we had decided that we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. And uh, this, is, this is me and Rob when we met <laughs> in the jungle. <laughs> and uh, that's the Amazon River where we were. It's your turn, my love. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> She's got the script. I'm free form. That's kind of how this works, I and mean, it works so well so far. So let I, all I want, I want to expound a little bit on tripping ten nights in the Amazon jungle. I can imagine every single one of you have a different idea about what exactly that means. So, 1999, there was this ethnobotanical conference happening down in the Amazon jungle focusing on ayahuasca. Ayo ayahuasca is this, it's the only combinatorial um, oh. plant hallucinogen. That's ayahuasca. a lot of words. So it's basically meaning that a mushroom you can pick up and eat and then shit happens. Smoke dope, stuff happens. This, you have to combine it. It's chemistry. It's folk chemistry. One without the other will not work. So um, ayahuasca has been in use in the Amazon jungle for millennia, for thousands of years. And this was a conference. It's not like a hippy-dippy, airy-fairy kind of thing that we went down to. There was 
anthropologists, ethnobotanists, ethnopharmacologists, and they were all interested in this phenomenon that lies behind ayahuasca and what happens when you knock back a, a, a stiff shot, kind of like a shot of espresso. There's the shamans right there. This guy's Francisco Montes. He's like a famous plant collector that has a place called Sachamama. Um, and going back to the 60s and the 70s, he's collected plants for some of the, 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 the greatest explorers that have gone down to the Amazon jungle. So back, back to this conference, we, we were there really looking for, for answers to the big questions that our upbringing, probably any, nobody's upbringing really provides as far as what the fuck am I doing here on this planet? The short time that I'm here, where do we come from? Where are we going? Those questions that since the Greeks pulled up their nets and went on to the shores and started rapping philosophy, nobody has the answers to those questions. Not one religion, not one philosophy, nobody. It's all supposition. So we were down there to, with that search, with those questions, and drinking this ayahuasca. And if you've never had those kinds of experiences, you know, it really, it, it's, it's very challenging. They say everybody goes into the experience white knuckled. No matter how many times you've done it, it is, it, you go in and you face the questions of life and death and you see visions and, and have insights. And so 1999, we're down there with all these scientists and researchers and every other night we're drinking ayahuasca and having these far out experiences. The following day, we come in, we sit around the circle, and we all talk about what happened the night before. And the thing that's like, to me now, 20 years later, it's fascinating, is right now in NYU, John Hopkins, UCLA, this stuff is like getting real. There's a psychedelic renaissance happening in this, on this planet right now where people very serious and scientifically are approaching this stuff and looking at what happens in that phenomenon, in that experience. And people who are dying with cancer and have terrible anxiety of facing death. People who come back from combat from Iraq, Afghanistan with PTSD because their friend got blown up right next to them and they can't integrate themselves. They're undergoing these experiences with these plants and these alkaloids and coming back with a 60% recovery rate from that shit. They're no longer fucked up and can't integrate back into society. So it, we were, there with these people kind of at the emergence of this, this discussion of what is this experience about? How can we use it? Obviously the folk medicine in the Amazon jungles use it for thousands of years to keep the tribe sane. So if, if we're not at a point on our planet where we need to keep the tribe sane, then I don't know what else has to happen for us to fucking wake up to that, and it's almost like the feminization of the planet with the rise of the women and the plants, which is very feminine, seems to be happening. And it's really interesting that that's where this whole origin story of Violetta, myself, and Dolcezza, you know, it's like, it's all from a psychedelic experience, which is like, how fucking cool is that, you know? So <laughs> go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's not a scripted, right? <laughs> no. Um, we traveled together for three months in the jungle. That's where we were. That's where I left you. And at the end of the trip, <laughs> at the end of the trip, uh, Rob moved down to Argentina with me. And now we're in the year 2001. And, and you probably don't remember. I see very young faces here. But um, the economy collapsed pretty bad in Argentina in 2001. And it was one of the many times. But this one was particularly bad. We had five presidents in 10 days. And people were dying on the streets. And Rob and I decided to join the protest. And, and we were out there, you know, because the government was corrupt and inept. And, and the protests were called the cacerolazos. So, so the cacerolazos was basically where people, I think it came from Spain to Argentina, but it's basically in signs of protest, you take your pots and pans out to the street and you bang them together. So you're like casserole pots or pans. So it was really weird. I didn't know what the hell was going on on the news. The De La Rua, the president, he had stepped down and the whole city just broke out in this cacophony of like, psh, 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 everybody like banging the pots and the pans. And so... Of course, we went down to the streets to join them. I had a drum. I took it down and started banging on the drums. 
And and kind of you know I mean I, it wasn't it, it was a, it was really interesting to be a part of that and to see that. But a lot of bad stuff happened. It's like within the 12 days or the 10 days, five different presidents stepped in, stepped down. There was uh, almost 100 deaths. There was fires, tear gas. Uh, all the supermarkets were being looted. So it was really pretty hardcore to be inside of that. And I'll always remember my, my father-in-law, Oscar, who's right here too, him and his wife, Bielita's mom, Isabel, OGs of Dolcezza all the way. They, um, I remember him saying to Isabel, say, voicing concern that I hope that the military doesn't try to take over, take power with the vacuum kind of that was present then. And that's just the history of South America and Argentina where the military had taken over back in the, in the um, mid 70s. So that was when I kind of clicked to me that w this was some grave shit going down. And being in America, we don't have that. We have this long history of, of you know, more democracy and not the military dictators, this and that, uh, up until now. <laughs> so back to Bialetta. Um, anyway, so it, it was so bad. I mean, the government actually seized everyone's bank accounts. People couldn't access their savings. So we were like, we need to get the hell out of here. But before we did that, we decided to get married. <laughs> Cute, right? So that's what we did. And two weeks after the wedding, something bad happened. I was diagnosed with cancer, and I was 23. I had a tumor in my uterus, and I had surgery, and the tumor reappeared in the walls of my uterus, so I had to have chemotherapy. It was a really dark time, right? But. Um, you guys all know that saying, what doesn't break you, make you stronger. So we just went through it together. Actually, one of the shamans, when we were in the Amazon, they actually said that what does kill you is what makes you stronger. So that just takes that whole <laughs> saying to the whole next level. When <laughs> As soon as I was um, given the clear from my cancer, um, we jumped on a plane and we moved to DC. And here we were with another one of our existential crises. Um, this time it was because we didn't like our jobs. Um, Rob was um, still a software engineer and I was an associate producer for film and video, but we came back home every night and all we talked about was, you know, that we wanted to change our lives and we wanted to do something together and follow our vision and create our own rules and be our own bosses. Um, so that's really when we decided to open Dolcezza. And we did it with the help of my mom and my stepdad. Um, my mom took a one week course on how to make gelato. <laughs> it was horrifying. She, yeah, she jumped on a plane and we opened the store. And if you came to this talk looking for answers on how to open a business, please don't do that. <laughs> it's not okay to open a business without knowing what the hell you're doing. Um, it, it was bad, but um, this, is our, this is our shop, we did it. Um, but it was super hard. Um, not only that, but um, I think it was two weeks after my parents got here that my stepdad was diagnosed with colon cancer, cancer again in our lives. And it was a stage four with metastasis in the liver and in the lungs, and um, he didn't die. I mean, he's sitting right here in the crowd, like Rob said. <laughs> Yeah, they, they call him Miracle Boy. I mean, I think that's what they call him in the hospital. And we have $100,000 to open the shop. 50000 from my parents and 50000 from Rob. And the contractor, who was not licensed, he took all of our money and ran away. So we had no money. We were super delayed. My stepdad was sick. And when we finally opened, I have no idea how we opened, but we went straight into the winter and we were cash flow negative. So it was really, really bad. Um, I have a confession to make. I, I cried for two years, every freaking night in the basement of our Georgetown shop with my mom making gelato. Um, yeah, it was bad. So this is when we were in the Georgetown shop. We were very young and very naive. And this is me and my mom in the basement, and I, I'm not crying in that picture, but I promise you there were a lot of tears. 
um, we, we had a silver lining. There's always a silver lining in life, right? And, and that was our customers. You know, we had customers like lines out the door. People loved our gelato. And, and I thought that was because of you and what you did with it. So, so like be like I said, when we opened in 2004, I was working my software engineering job doing a, another install, actually with the Department of Defense, if you can imagine that. The hippies from the jungles drinking ayahuasca. Bileta's whole family from Argentina were all these leftists and like, like her grandmother was like this amazing person, this personal friend of Fidel Castro that took a boat from Argentina to Spain in the 20s to fight against Franco. I know this is way off script, but- Way it, off script. It is so, <laughs> you got, I, yeah. that's like really cool shit. But I love um, her. So, so the thing is, I was still working when we opened, so it was like, you know, going and doing the software, coming home, changing, running to the shop to scoop and make coffee and clothes at night, and then go back home and do the whole thing again. She was studying her first semester in English at American University to get her, finish her film and education. My father-in-law's dying on our sofa in DuPont. Um, circle farmers market it was fucked up it was hardcore it was the fire that you go through that either burns you and you're no longer there or it burns all the impurities the stuff that really doesn't matter that we preoccupy ourselves every single day with and and we all went through that fire 2006 I was able to quit my software job and go full-time in Dolcezza and I lost my mind I com I, I, I loved food before that but when I went to Dolcezza and went into the kitchen, that's when I just, I, I fell down a deep, deep rabbit hole. And it really happened when I went to the farmer's market and found all these characters growing all this amazing stuff that were on fire about the soil, the ecosystem of the, the, the soil, that microorganisms, how that translates into these amazing flavors and the nutrient density. And that's Zach, Zachariah Lester right there. Uh, he's like my biblical vegetable grower. He's so hardcore. He, I, half of the time when he speaks, I don't understand what he's saying because it's all a metaphor. It's about the pollinator bees taking the pollen from the flower, the next generation. So I, I fell so in love with that, their story. And they struggle so much to do what they do. So their passion, their love for, for growing food on their land. And within... About eight months time, that's when kind of the, the, the set of 30 flavors that we had co-opted from my mother-in-law, her one week class, so we just put the 30 flavors that they had down in Argentina on the gelaterias, became 250 flavors plus that changed all the time. So it really defined who we were personally and what we really were into and how we wanted to express ourselves in Dolcetta in our shops and our food and it defined Dolcezza for the rest of the time for the last 15 years where anything that grows locally here, we're only going to use it within the natural growing season. And so about 70% of all ingredients that we still purchase today come from all these farmer characters here. And it's just, we went into it very naively. We just, we really wanted to do our own thing. That greater degree of freedom from doing your own thing was what it really was all about. And we just happened to come upon the richness, the beauty of the food that's grown that you find in the farmer's markets around here. And then the other dimension of the people that grow that. They're crazy. They're on fire. They're amazing. And they're beautiful. And so just that whole intersection really transformed us and defined us and continues to define us today with, with Dolcezza. And it's, it's really awesome. So... One day, um, we were at our little Georgetown shop, and a customer who used to talk to us a lot invited us for dinner to his house. And by the end of the dinner, he gave us a big check for store number two. And we hadn't even thought about store number two. I was uh, still in my crying phase, remember? <laughs> but we were embraced and you know, propelled by our community. And so we opened another store in Bethesda. And uh, this is our opening night in Bethesda. And then after that, we had a bunch of friends who came to us and they were like, hey, we love what you guys are doing and we want to invest our savings with you guys. They were crazy, but yeah, they did it. Um, 
And that's how we opened store number three in Dupont Circle. And um, by 2012, our little shop in Georgetown was too small to accommodate our production. And we opened a factory in Union Market. And we decided to open more stores. And so we did. And through all of that, from starting in the <laughs> basement of Georgetown, 300 square feet, feet of space, having no idea what we were doing. And to now today, where we have 200 employees, we have eight locations, um, we have this factory here, we're doing wholesale. It started with us doing absolutely everything. The opening, the closing, the hiring, the firing, the scooping, every cappuccino served. Everything was us. And it was like that for the first four years until we opened the second store in Bethesda in 2008. And then it totally changed where we obviously could not, we could no longer be in both places at once. So then this whole thing uh, became about building this team and bringing in the people that gave a shit as much or as close to as much as you possibly could as we did. And that's, it, this whole evolution of the business and having a business is we never stop to to be open to that process and learning kind of like at this moment in time, what's the best ways to do that? And the really cool thing is a lot of these people of our inner circle that we've had and that they go out and actually are doing the physical work. We're not sitting there scooping, we're not making the gelato anymore ourselves. It's our crew that's doing that. And it's all about the people that you surround yourself with because they're the ones ultimately that are translating the values or how important this is or who the farmer is or what season it is. So a lot of our inner circle are actually here tonight who are up there behind the bar, who are right back there in the back. And it's these people that they, they also have that same spark and that same passion that, that, that we do for the, for the food and, and, and the space and the experience. And we still make gelato the same way that we always did. Um, but now we not only share the love here in DC, we sell pints in grocery stores all around the country. And the way that we make it all work is that we have a truly equal partnership in the house and in the business. Um, we let each other be who we are. We don't try to change each other. Um, and, um, and I think that we deeply believe in self-reflection and less ego, um, and we don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, the most important thing for us is the relationship with ourselves, and then with each other, and then with the kids, and then comes the business. Um, and when I say that we don't take ourselves too seriously, I mean it, you know. After all, we're all, you know, spinning on a planet, in a galaxy, in an infinite universe, so. Which We're still tri tripping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say we, we try to enjoy our short time on Earth. We have not come down. And, <laughs> and we do so by sharing what we love. Thank you very much, you all. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks.